This session is about the human rights case against harmful behavior modification for autistic people. Um, we are represented here with three organizations. So there's the Autistic Collaboration Trust. We are incorporated uh, here in Aotearoa as a charitable trust uh, and we operate internationally. And we've got uh, Tanya from the Autistic Tr Strategies Network uh, based in South Africa and Karen uh, based in Kenya uh, from Kenyans living with autism. Um, in terms of what we're covering here, so a little overview. Um, Tanya is from South Africa. Yeah, I'm here from Aotearoa or also known as New Zealand. We'll start with a brief introduction to autistic ways of being and an introduction to the commercial interests and human rights violations of the global autism industry. Then we'll have Karen to present the situation of autistic people in Kenya. And then following Karen's support from Kenya, Tanya will read out a text from non-speaking autistic people in South Africa and around the world. That's a very important topic because some of the most vulnerable among us are not able to communicate and not speak. Um, we had planned to have uh, Kim Crawley here to report from Canada. Um, unfortunately, as so often is the case with uh, autistic people, she's been overwhelmed by events in her life. So we'll cover um, Canada and Ontario without Karen, uh, Kim. Um, and following Kim, or what she was going to talk about, I will um, talk about the campaign to ban all forms of conversion therapies here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which has been very well received by some of our government ministers. And um, we'll conclude with a presentation on the global outlook across the growing number of coordinated campaigns by autistic organizations around the world to ban all forms of conversion therapies or applied behavior analysis, ACA, ABA. And then we'll conclude with uh, a 15 minute Q&A. We've already received many questions uh, leading up to um, the event here. And uh, if we have time, we'll also answer any live questions. Those questions that we don't cover, um, we'll surely cover them in future sessions or in articles that you can follow um, on our websites. Um, so, now the introduction here to, well, what are autistic ways of being and uh, what are the commercial interests of the so-called autism industry and um, what are the human rights violations um, that we're dealing with. Um, the difference in autistic social cognition is best described in terms of a heightened level of conscious processing of raw information signals from the environment and an absence of or significantly reduced level of subconscious filtering of social information. So autistic children tend to take longer to learn how to decode nonverbal signals from the social world, in particular signals related to abstract cultural concepts related to the negotiation of social status. Many autistic people are also hyper and or hyposensitive to certain sensory inputs from the physical environment. That means some artists may be bothered or impaired by a broad range of different stimuli, whereas others are only impacted by very specific stimuli. Autistic ways of being res uh, result in individually unique usage patterns of the human brain and often in unique levels of expertise and creativity within specific domains of interest. And uh, that's typically related to autistic inertia and perseverance. Um, so autistic neurology ultimately shapes the human experience of the world across multiple dimensions. Now, um, the most useful definition uh, of autistic ways of being is the definition that's been crafted by autistic communities over the last few years. So we talk about the communal definition of autistic ways of being, and uh, we define these autistic ways of being as 
neurological variants that cannot be understood without the social model of disability. Members of the autistic civil rights movement recognize autistic traits as natural variations of motivations and ways of being, i.e. ways of perceiving, feeling, thinking, caring, moving, interacting, relating, and communicating within the human species. Although some autistic people cannot rely on speech to communicate, most non-speaking artists do not have an intellectual ability, disability. Um, so in the absence of a comprehensive neurological and genetic description, um, which may actually forever remain elusive because uh, humans are complex, the best way to describe autistic ways of being is in terms of first-hand lived experience of autistic cognition and autistic motivation. So what you see here is just some of the feedback on this communal definition, uh, which uh, we developed within autistic communities uh, in 2019, and which we've since updated a few times uh, based on input and, and further feedback uh, from the autistic community. And we'll see that here on this screen, how that's been received. So I think from our perspective, it's time to move away from the clinical definitions of uh, so-called autism um, that uh, we've been handed down uh, from clinicians over the decades earlier. Um, there's also autistic researchers researching um, autistic ways of being. And uh, one very, uh, I think, uh, interesting and well-received theory is uh, monotropism. That's the tendency for our interest to pull us in more strongly than most people. It rests on a model of the mind as an interest system. We are all interested in many things and our interests help direct our intention. Different interests are salient at different times. In a monotropic mind, fewer interests tend to be aroused at any time and they attract more of our processing resources, making it harder to deal with things outside of our current attention uh, tunnel. That can be a huge asset in many fields. Intense focus is indispensable in science, maths, technology, music, art, and philosophy, amongst others. This common feature of the autistic psyche is often squandered when workplaces and schools are not set up to allow it. Um, and we can trace the history of uh, the pathologization of autistic ways of being back to the early days of the industrial era. So um, Adolf Quintelet's invention of the so-called average man in the 1840s in Belgium, um, that's where it, uh, you can say it started. So that was a time of colonial expansion marked the moment when average became normal, the individual became error and stereotypes were validated with the imprint of science. And his simplistic and incorrect assumptions would eventually prompt generations of parents to worry if their child did not develop according to the average milestones and cause almost everyone to feel anxiety when their health, social life, or career deviated too far from the average. Um, the most so I'll quote here something uh, that Nick Walker has written, and I think she's made some very astute observations here. Um, the most insidious sort of social inequality, the most difficult sort of privilege to challenge occurs when a dominant group is so deeply established as the normal or default group that it has no specific name, no label the members of such a group are simply thought of as normal people, healthy people, or just people, with the implications that those who aren't members of that group represent deviations from that which is normal and natural, rather than equal, natural, and legitimate manifestations of human diversity. Um, I would like to add to this that industrialized societies can learn a lot from indigenous cultures and from other marginalized cultures, such as autistic culture. We have a culture, we have communities, and 
pathologization of autistic people and other dimensions of neurodiversity as a social power game that removes agency from neurodivergent people. So from our perspective, social progress is overdue. Diversity is inclusion. Up to one in five people are considered neurodivergent from the hypernormative perspective of our industrialized society. Neurodivergent people adhere to innate moral value systems rather than social norms imposed from the outside. They are okay with exploring ideas that upset the social order. They spend much more time experimenting and implementing ideas that others might consider crazy or a waste of time. They tend to have untypical life goals, new forms of understanding, making a positive impact, translating ideas into artistic expression. Artists in particular have unusually developed pattern recognition abilities and an unusual ability to persevere. Neurodiverse teams are capable of achieving things that seem out of reach for others. So standardization or normalization is a double-edged sword. When one group of people with a big megaphone makes claims that compliance with a specific standard makes a positive difference, there is an obligation not only to assess whether the claim is true, but also an obligation to review whether the proposed standard or so-called best practice may violate the human rights of some other groups. And now we get to the infamous autism industry, which is a business opportunity and which involves the torture of autistic people. Autistic people continuously work at the edge of their performance limit, which is often much higher than what non-autistic people are capable of sustaining, whilst not making a fuss about it. And that invites exploitation. Torture of autistic people is not only legal, it is sold as the ultimate business opportunity and money-making machine to the extent that they're even fighting over who gets to exploit us. And I, quite frankly, am lost for words. So here you've got a book where they talk about this and they've got conferences where they discuss the investment opportunities. So where does this all come from? Um, well, gay conversion therapy and autistic conversion therapy are related, they've been invented by the same person. So I'll give you uh, a couple of minutes to read this quote here. So, uh, but for context, Ivar Lovas is the originator of gay conversion therapy and autistic conversion therapy, which today is known as Applied Behavior Analysis or ABA. The quote on the screen captures the essence of the underlying assumptions and motivations. Basically, Ivalovas denied the humanity of autistic children. So that was in the 1960s and it's been going on ever since and it's still growing. Now, hopefully we're in the process of changing this. Uh, so there's a counter trend and that's known as the new diversity movement. So here uh, I've got two slides with a timeline of where we're coming from. And I already mentioned out of Quintilat's invention of the average man, but really we can even go back a bit further. So hypernormalization of social norms can be traced back to the mid 1700s. It started with compulsory regulated state education and a focus on Christian religion, singing, reading and writing based on a regulated state-provided curriculum of textbooks. Um, teachers were often former soldiers. Compulsory schooling based on the Prussian model then spread to other countries. The 19, uh, the, uh, yeah, it's only in the 1980s and 90s that we saw the first autobiographies from autistic people. Um, and that's what uh, can be considered yeah, the, the first start where autistic people started to become visible. In 1993, Jim Sinclair wrote, Don't Mourn for Us, which marked the beginnings of autistic culture and autism as a way of being. Then in 1998, Judy Singer wrote about new diversity, which resulted in this new paradigm within the, within the disability rights movement, 
and it's the last great liberation movement to emerge from the 20th century. So since then, we've had some pushback. So in the 1990s, this idea of monotropism was developed by autistic researchers, only for the autism industry then to push back against the new diversity movement with dehumanizing and neo-colonial pseudoscience, resulting in books such as Zero Degrees of Empathy. And I'll leave it to you to assess uh, why someone would come up with a title that reads like that. Um, in 2012, then, Damien Milton, uh, an autistic researcher, alerts the world to the double empathy problem. So trouble with empathy and social skills is a two-way street between autistic and non-autistic people. It's not a deficit of autistic people. Um, then now, since 2016, we've got software firms that are, and, and other corporations that are attempting to co-opt the neurodiversity movement by embracing so-called neurodiversity light and introducing autism at work schemes for a systematic exploitation of autistic people for economic gains. So this exploitation has become a very unfortunate reality and we are pushing back hard. From 2019 onwards, um, activists have increasingly campaigned for openly autistic culture and autistic community. Open the autistic people collaborated around this communal definition of autistic ways of being, which describes for the first time autistic experience and defines autistic identity in terms of, yeah, first time lived experience of how our cognition works and what our motivations are. Um, in 2020 then, I introduced the notion of uh, cultural immune systems in which I describe how autistic traits play an essential role in cultural evolution. And they've done that since the yeah, beginnings of our species, i.e. artists tend to be highly concerned about social justice and are best understood as the agents of a well-functioning cultural immune system. And that's exactly why in a hyper-normalized world, people are uncomfortable having autistic people around. So, um, that's the introduction, and now I would like to hand over to um, Karen to talk about uh, the situation of autistic people and the spread of conversion therapies in Kenya. To you, Karen. Thank you so much, uh, John, for this incredible presentation. Um, I will talk uh, about the situation of uh, conversion therapies in Kenya. Before I do that, I will uh, briefly talk about the CRPD and what it says, right? Um, and uh, principle uh, comment number eight, uh, this principle says nothing about us without us. And I'll go briefly to comment note number seven of the 2018 uh, convention of the CRPD makes it very clear that organizations setting the direction for disabled people must be led by disabled people. Now, I will uh, briefly talk about um, uh, Kenya in, in light of uh, the, the situation of um, therapies. Um, our attempts at a direction setting to have, uh, you know, to warn people about uh, what's happening in, in terms of therapy has been uh, dashed due to how people have been um, perceived autistic people like us in Kenya. You have to remember that a majority, it, there are not many autistic people who are able to advocate for themselves. Only a few minority people have been able to advocate for themselves. <laughs> um, autistic people like myself, and most of the time <laughs> with a, a lot of autistic children, many are, are stigmatized because of um, how people view um, us in general. And, it is related from the medical model, uh, as as Johanna stated, then that, that uh, persons with disabilities, that autistic people like myself, uh, autistic people, are viewed as burdens and everything else. So we find that parents really want to make their children normal by this kind of conversion therapies, and now this is really uh, very rampant in Kenya. Um, 
where we see a lot of parents wanting to make their children look neurotypical. Autistic people like myself from Africa have been trying the, the bare minimum to really, uh, to warn people about the expansion of uh, therapies, of conversion therapies, but unfortunately it was not, we have been largely ignored. So it means that we have tried the hardest to just let people know, send, send an alarm clock to everyone in Africa that um, this is happening and, you know, we shouldn't let this happen. It is because of the, um, the neo-colonization view of uh, behavior that autistic people are, are, are burdens to everyone. So there's an organization that has made its way here and uh, they want to promote uh, this kind of conversion therapies on vulnerable autistic children in Africa by using their westernized kind of uh, neuro, neuro colonization movements. And a majority of those who go through conversion therapies are non-speaking autistic children. Non-speaking, we have a population of non-speakers here in Kenya, and because of um, and because of the lack of services needed and lack of uh, uh, assistive devices to help non-speaking autistic people in Kenya communicate, that presents and even depriving them of just the bear of assistive, assistive devices, which is stipulated under the CRPD. So the relevant article <laughs> that we need to refer to under this is Article 8 of Awareness Creation, which I believe it should be done. And uh, under Article 15, it says freedom from torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment for persons with disabilities. That means we need to protect um, countries must be able to ensure that no one is tortured or treated in a cruel and inhumane manner. Under Article 16 of the CRPD, it says this quote, freedom from exploitation, violence and abuse. Now countries have to ensure that they protect people with disability both in and outside their homes from all forms of violence and abuse and from people who try to take advantage of them. They must provide help and support for people with disability and their families and carers, including through teaching them how to avoid, recognize and report violence and abuse and people who take advantage of them. I will making sure the countries must make sure that protection services take into account the person's age, gender, and disability. Under Article 23 of the CRPD, now this is a major uh, concern that I have, the right to privacy. <laughs> now, this is a very important article within the CRPD where we see some people filming, filming children in like in meltdown moods, like now autistic children who are experiencing uh, meltdowns. Now this is not right. This is this is this is an alarm, and it, and it should be it should be applied to. I'll state that countries are have they have to take appropriate steps to make sure that people with disability have the same rights as other people when it comes to just anything. But, but here we're going to be focusing a lot on protecting the privacy of an autistic person. The last uh, article uh, of the CRPD talks about education, the right to access to education. Now in Kenya, we are still grappling with uh, lack of education towards uh, autistic children because schools do not have reasonable accommodation, universal design, or even uh, the pro uh, provisions of assistive devices and lack of training of teachers in matters to do with disabilities. If we are to prevent this uh, conversion therapies and even abuse of autistic children within our school environment, it is our job to ensure that 
we engage with the NGOs and tell them that this has to stop. This has to really stop because we are really endangering the lives of African autistic children. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, okay. Next, we'll then have Tanya to uh, talk uh, specifically about non-speaking autistic people in South Africa and elsewhere in the world. So Tanya, over to you. Thank you, Jan. I'm going to just for, I see that many of us here are actually autistic, um, are familiar with conversion therapies, behavior modification, ABA, these kinds of terms. But for those who are not familiar with this, and especially since we would like to spread this message in the disability community beyond, I'm going to take a bit of extra time because our fourth panelist, Kim, is not here, so that I can just expand on what is this, that what we're talking about. We've heard from Jan before the history of how it started and that it became a worldwide booming business. ABAI, which is an international organization for people who do this therapy, they are aggressively expanding across the, the globe. They have like a business development arm to try to get into the poorest countries, establish a footprint over there. And you might say, well, that sounds very magnanimous. In other words, they're being very nice if they're getting into the poorest areas. They're not. They're getting into the poorest areas and replacing something which is already bad with something which is worse. Um, out of the frying pan and in, into the fire. And there will be sponsorships and they will raise their money. They will make sure that they do get their money. Um, I will return to the point as well of, to say that not everybody who is necessarily involved in the abuse industry is actually evil. We have, I have a friend in the audience tonight who was involved in this and who was an ABA therapist. And I can assure you she's a very nice person and she had very good intentions when she got into this too. Um, she just was very misguided, as many parents who, uh, are as well. The people at the top, perhaps not quite so misguided. So let's just briefly state what ABA is and what it actually does. It's based on, for, for people who are unfamiliar with it, and ABA therapists really don't like us to use this con, uh, you know, comparison, but it does work kind of like dog training, and it was originally based on uh, behavioral models of, of dogs and other animals in laboratories, where if you if you ignore that what the dog is doing, the dog realizes it's not going to get attention from you. So no matter what it's going through, whether it's thirsty or whatever, it's not going to try to get help from you anymore. But if you pay, you know, if you want the dog to do a certain thing, you've got to then reward it with something if you want it to do a thing. So it's that kind of uh, action. It's Whatever we want to you to stop doing, we will punish or we will ignore. And whatever we want you to keep doing, we will reward. We will, and to do that, we have to find out what you like. So it starts off with the observe, observation of uh, a child usually, uh, like what are their favorite toys? What are the favorite things they like doing? And these things are then later withheld and then used as rewards based on depending on what kind of behavior you want to change. And what sort of things do they want to do? Well, for example, many autistic people struggle with eye contact, even in a, in a you know situation like this, might not even look at the camera. Um, uh, I don't currently struggle with that. I have at times had difficulties with it. So if the parents say, and we have had that in Africa, parents saying, we want the, uh, our son to look at the camera when we have family photos. Can you train him into this? You know, so they will withhold things from him. They will give him rewards if he does this. This may not seem all that cruel until you start realizing what some of the methods are that people use and when they will ignore um, people who are struggling. So uh, it, the example of probably the ultimate cruelty, which is still in existence today, would be in Massachusetts in America, where they use electrical shocks strapped to people's bodies 24 hours a day. And then if the behavior is not to the liking of the people who have designed what that person must behave like, then they will remotely shock that person. So you can be shocked at any, any time of the day. Um, this has been described very obviously. I mean, this is torture. You're not allowed to even do this to prisoners. So it has been described as torture. The UN Rapporteur on Torture has visited, you know, contacted America and said, you, you've got to stop this from happening in your country. That has not happened. America is not very keen on listening to the United Nations and many things. And that's why we are, when we're focusing on the CRPD as well in our talks here, we realize that America is not going to always respond to this, but 
you can a focus on countries where the CRPD has been uh, ratified. It is an international treaty after all. And when they've ratified the treaty, it means they have to make laws, uh, regardless if whether the government is currently focusing on that and everything, but you can hold them to account. There are processes for that. Okay, so ABA does those things. Now, many people will say, and this is a key important thing to say, we are not as bad as those people in Massachusetts. We are not torturing people in that way. We are simply, if a child behaves in a way that we want to stop, we will just look away and we will just ignore them and they will can have a tantrum and we will just ignore that so that they learn to stop that behavior. That in itself is cool. And it goes through a series of stages as well. If somebody does not change their behavior, they will go from planned ignoring to isolating the person, they will eventually go into seclusion, putting them into a, a room, tying them up, holding them down, you know, there's a process of, of how it escalates if a person doesn't change the behavior to the liking of, of or to the prescription of whoever it was who decided they have to change something. But that's not all. ABAI, this international organization, which is kind of like an umbrella body for anybody who is in this profession, you can join this. If you have a, a university that trains in ABA, anything, or if you have a, a company that is listed on the stock exchange to provide this kind of therapy, then ABAI as an organization is fine with that form of torture. As well, the governance bodies, such as the BACB, which is the board that certify, well, one of the boards that certify people to do this type of therapy, they have powerful people within their organization who are also doing that level of torture. So if somebody says, oh, I would never do it, then they'll say, well, like, who do you report to? Would your organization allow it? Does your code of ethics allow it? Yes, the code of ethics of uh, BACB, you know, you can, you can do these things. So the people who are governing it and supposed to be in charge of the ethics in these organizations are not ethical. They have strong codes of ethics. Yes, you must not allow to bribe the, um, you know, the client and uh, you know, who's paying and, and all these kinds of things, but they will not listen, you, you, you don't get your foot in the door as a group of autistic people who have been harmed and want to speak out against this. There's also very little recourse. You can't have be damaged by ABA for years and years and years and now sue somebody. It doesn't happen because you, you sue them, they were only doing um, their job. Tanya, just paper. conscious of time, we're right. a bit late here. So maybe I think uh, we cut over to the situation of non-speaking people. Right. So at this stage, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn sideways to do this so that I can read this off from my screen. I would like to start off by reading the words of somebody who was not able to speak until she was 12 years old. And one of the reasons why they were not able to speak was because they were not able to do the motor movements. They said they couldn't will their body to do that. They were deprived of food to motivate them. Whereas what they needed was not motivation. What they needed was help with their body. This is very common among non-speaking people. They need help with their body, not help with the motivation so much. Now, um, I'll tell you who it was in a moment, and but I'll read the words first. ABA did not and does not, they write, take into account the physical differences in autistic neurology, look for root causes. Instead, it forces the autistic to endure fear and pain while suppressing outward signs like crying, vomiting, eloping, covering ears or flapping. And this person did actually attempt to run away many times, but was brought back. Once the outward signs of distress are gone, ABA claims that the distress is gone once the outward signs are gone. By the time that my uncle began molesting me, ABA had taught me through the way that it forced me to endure pain for the comfort of others, that my body was not my own. When my uncle came into my room at night to molest me, my first thought in my child mind that this was the same thing as therapy, that if I was quiet and kept my body still, it will be over quicker than if I fought, because I learned that in ABA as well. And when my first partner began hitting me when I was 18 through to 20 something, I was convinced that some, it had something to do with me as if I was bad or broken person and that deserved this. ABA had taught me that the people who purport to love me will hurt me. 
And with the same breath, they will say that they have my best interests in mind. So this is common. ABA grooms you for not having boundaries. Now, the person who wrote this, JJ Madridge, did eventually learn to speak, but they say it's not their first language. Their first language is really poetry and words were for a long time kind of trained out as much as they tried to get them to speak. Um, it became harder and it became the thing that you love became the thing that you hated for a very long time. There is a link to this, by the way, on the Autistic Strategies Network website in one of our articles on ABA. There's a link to this particular page as well. Now, I would like to read as well, just briefly, some of the types of messages that we get from people who are still non-speaking. Bear in mind that these people who are non-speaking therefore had to get some kind of method by which they could communicate. And we have some in the audience this evening as well. Um, somebody had to recognize that they were not intellectually disabled, that speech wasn't going to be the answer and had to enable that to be, for them to be able to get these words out. So eventually maybe it started with pointing to a, a letter board. Eventually it might end up with independently typing on a keyboard, for example. So some of these messages, which we have, and from, in, in, in South Africa, um, the children who have gone through this, some of them are black. Most of my uh, non-speaking fellow activists who are young people are black. And a word that comes up often among them to describe what they experienced in ABA was torture. And when they describe what was what done to them, things like food deprivation, not allowed to go to the toilets, and, or not allowed to get off the toilet until you poop as well. It's those kinds of things that, that happen. So the word torture comes up often. William from America, um, who is an older teenager, says, I am a living victim of abuse. And yet I know my abusers love me, but they didn't know any better. Philip writes, I have the li lived the consequences of my parents' wrong assumptions. Nico writes, no child should be in 40 hours of therapy like I was. Stopping my behavior was the wrong way to go. If we just pick up on my parents loved me. Yes, we know parents who came out of that who feel terribly guilty. In South Africa, I know a mother and son. She had tried everything to save her son from this terrible thing called autism because he could not speak. You know, it was all useless in the end. What he needed was just help with communication. And yes, he is still disabled. He is now studying towards his final school year. He intends to have a job one day. He will not speak ever, probably. Um, but he has, the, he has the right communication now, at least. And they are getting therapy to restore their relationship after all the harm that his mother did to him out of her own best, you know, thinking she had his best interest in heart. The difference, though, that comes in when we actually start taking a look at real evidence, ABA claims to be very evidence-based, um, but the evidence is actually not there. <laughs> they, they, they do experiments which do not align to the CRPD, that do not align to the uh, Declaration of Helsinki, do not align to any of these things that you're supposed to align to. They do not have adverse events tracking, in other words, what's the long-term effect of what you do, that have pervasive conflicts of interest. This has been researched, by the way, there are papers on what is wrong with ABA and the problem with the evidence base. So they're not looking at the principle of nothing about us without us. However, when we look at that principle, you get parents starting to ask actual autistic people what works for you. You start finding, parents start finding a child like their child. If the average parent of a non-speaking child came to Tanya to say, what was your childhood like and how did you manage to turn out this way? This would not be relevant because your child has a different type of autism, a different type of disability. You may need to look like a at a child like this child, whose words I read in the beginning, J.J. Madridge. You may need to take a look at the writing of um, Damon Kersebaum, who's in the, in the audience tonight, and at some of the many non-speaking autistic people. And Damon says over here, yes, Tanya, all of this, yet when non-speakers speak out, and I would really like to read his words since he is offering that up to us before I close off this evening. And then uh, after Damon's words, then I will um, end this. So Damon has said in the chat here, let's see whether I can scroll up. 
Yet, when non-speakers speak up about the trauma, we are extremely vulnerable to online attacks and our worms, uh, sorry, our worms, our words are framed as not being produced by um, by us. By not being produced by us. ABA advocates have strategized to silence us. And yes, that we certainly see. We see this online. We see this in person. We, I have seen children who start to progress in terms of their AAC use, in other words, using assistive devices or point and so on, and they start reporting abuse, which is happening to them. And the parent then takes them out of that therapy because once they start addressing the people who are accused of abuse, what happens is those people say, don't listen to them. If you stick with this approach, getting this communication, they'll never speak. Give them to us, we'll teach them to speak, and then the speaking never happens. So they are silenced. And as Desiree Pillay, the mother of a non-speaker who later learned to speak, said, a silent victim is a perfect victim. So when you listen to actual autistic people, when you listen to non-speakers, you'll find out what is really going on, but you'll also find out what really helps. And if I can leave everybody with one message today on a positive note is listen to non-speaking autistic people. They're most likely to be targeted with this kind of abuse. Communication is a human right. Behaving like somebody else decides is not your duty. Over to you. Thank you, Tanya. That was great. Um, and but Kim doesn't have time to attend today because yeah, she's been overwhelmed by by life. Um, and uh, we could skip over to yeah, we'll continue in a minute. I'm just reflecting on um, all the wonderful messages here. Um, I think, yeah, I'd like to reiterate one more thing here. So listening to non-speaking people means really listening to these people and not necessarily to the parents um, who may have a different uh, tack on things. So it's important, I think, there to distinguish. You cannot always entrust people around those uh, autistic people who claim to be speaking for them. Um, I think it's always a matter of handing the mic over to the people who are being spoken about. So if I, as a speaking autistic person, I'm talking about ABA and saying it's all bad, I need to listen to ABA survivors and see whether they say so. I need to listen to non-speaking people if I'm speaking about uh, non-speaking people. I need to listen to black autistic people if I'm speaking about the overall autistic experience because it cannot only be defined by people from one culture or from one you know, level of privilege. So nothing about us without us stretches further perhaps than we, we sometimes might think. We all think we're autistic, but we can't speak for other autistic people always. We need to let as many autistic people as possible be heard. And linking up to what you said about not listening to parents. Yes, I agree. We should not be listening to parents who do not listen to, <laughs> to people like their child. And the same would go for school for therapists as well. We have therapists in the audience here. We have um, the founder of the Therapist Neurodiversity um, Network. I think that was the last part of the work. We have uh, Badu yeah, uh, We can, well. Tanya, we can document all this. Let's uh, not lose uh, track of time here because we do want to cover, I think, the questions that we have. And so uh, I quickly want to say just uh, what uh, Kim was going to talk about, so that's uh, in uh, Ontario and Canada. Um, ABA um, is currently has been mandated as the support for autistic students in schools. And uh, so just reflect on that for a minute, uh, considering what we've just heard. So uh, that's even in a, a country like uh, Canada where People talk about uh, upholding human rights. We've got these types of approaches mandated as the supports uh, for students who are autistic. Uh, basically taking 
agency away from these students and uh, yeah, preparing these uh, students for abuse later in, in life. Um, now, I wanted to talk about um, briefly the campaign to ban all forms of conversion therapies here in Aotearoa um, because uh, we need uh, some good news or <laughs> I think here as, as well. Uh, I mean, right now we're not in the best possible place. So even over here, uh, a country that uh, is often considered very progressive on, on, on many fronts. Um, uh, if you read the autism spectrum disorder guideline uh, that our government has published, and that's the guideline that is still active this year, it says all behavioral interventions are based on the science of applied behavior analysis. So that's where we're at here. This science of ABA is nothing more than experimentation with tools of coercion and torture. And yes, you can apply scientific rigor to the process, but that in no way justifies torture. And um, yeah, here's some uh, quotes from local papers. What's uh, happening here in New Zealand? I mean, this is, I didn't uh, update this recently, but uh, this is just from a few years ago. I don't think it's changed much. So uh, I'll, yeah, if you want, we'll publish the, the slides. You can look at these articles. Um, things are not looking good uh, or rosy uh, for autistic people all over the world. And then um, on top of that, we now have new diversity light where those autistic people who are often considered high functioning, which is another one of those uh, very um, dangerous uh, ableist labels. Um, our movement um, is being um, co-opted by big corporations with lots of money. So, Unfortunately, we have good reason to side-eye what man, one might call neurodiversity light. When neurotypical people who either use the language of the movement in good faith or intentionally co-opt it, undermine its work by overlooking or outright contradicting its core concepts, including bodily autonomy and basic dignity. If anything, such inauthentic trappings of neurodiversity can allow charities, service providers and caregivers to effectively disguise ableist stereotypes and harmful practices for audiences that aren't aware of or attuned to them. So it's really time to liberate neurodiversity from the pathology paradigm. And this comes back to this basic principle of nothing about us without us. Autistic voices must be central and, and that's, um, that means to hell with so-called balance because uh, there is no balance between um, what the, the rights of autistic people and um, what those are claiming who are abusing autistic people. Um, now the progress that we've made locally here, um, we uh, started off with a petition in 2021, um, inquiring into the consequences of conversion therapies for autistic children. And then we've run a campaign, we've set up uh, a dedicated website to educate the public here in New Zealand. Um, we had a submission um, to our government, uh, to a select committee in September last year. That was very well received. I'll read from that on the next few slides. And um, yeah, now we're moving onwards. We've uh, aligned uh, well with um, organizations, autistic organizations all over the world. So that's what we're doing in the Autistic Collaboration Trust. We're now focusing explicitly on the human rights violations based on the CRPD. And we've now got a global consortium of, consortium of these organizations uh, with this focus. Locally, um, here's what one of our MPs uh, said after we presented our case. She says, it seems to me that communities, people with disabilities have been excluded from this bill. So she's talking about the conversion therapy ban bill in New Zealand that applies to gay conversion therapy, which is currently being legislated. It seems that you are, if you are prohibiting a practice, then we should prohibit it, it for whoever it happens to. 
And that's exactly what we're aiming for. Uh, it, ABA is, shouldn't be used on anyone, not on autistic people, not on other kinds of disabled people. Um, no one should be subjected to this torture. Uh, another quote here, so they're thanking us for our submission and for raising very valid concerns about the experiences of autistic people. Um, here in New Zealand, uh, we can also tap into um, a vast body of knowledge about Tanga Māori. So um, that's uh, the Māori knowledge system um, from local uh, cultures here in this country, indigenous cultures where neurodivergent people didn't used to be labeled in this country. So this whole pathologization is something that actually came with colonialism to New Zealand. And well, yeah, now we can uh, talk about outlook. Uh, where are we at? So this, um, we've now got this global campaign going uh, of autistic organizations to ban all forms of ABA across the world. So um, I will provide a bit of introduction here. So to sum up from my perspective, um, we need to change the culture to create a much more inclusive culture because it is ultimately the life experience of neurodivergent people that is at stake. So we are being traumatized, not because we're autistic, but it's be we're traumatized because it's the way our society works and the way our society imposes constraints on autistic people that are incompatible with our humanity. Um, and just because the majority of people, once they are fully programmed by our mainstream culture, perceives a growing minority of people, let's say one in six, as not fully conforming to cultural expectations, it does not mean that there's anything biologically or mentally wrong with these nonconformists. From a sociological and biological perspective, the rising numbers of cultural nonconformists may just as well be seen as an indicator of an increasingly sick society characterized by cultural norms that are incompatible with human biological and social needs. So we're really calling for a kinder world that celebrates interdependence. The, the, the social model of disability explains, I think, two of the most disabling aspects of autistic ways of being. To a significant extent, autistic experience can be described in terms of the downstream effect of, of, of two things. One, the inability to maintain hidden agendas, and that makes us prime targets for exploitation. And it induces fear by our tendency to expose the hidden agenda of others. So autistic levels of honesty work against us in the deceptive society that we've created. The second part is our hypersensitives, sensitivities of, you know, regarding stimuli from the physical environment, but also in the social realm, rejection of all forms of social status. Um, and that then leads to the perception of not just that we are not just not trying hard enough or that we are uncooperative. And that then results in frequent sensory overload, autistic burnout, depression, and even suicidal ideation. Wherever autistic people go, they expose social power games and pathologization, we have to realize, is the pushback from a sick society. Um, what we are also doing in our globally coordinated campaign is we're tapping into the design justice network principles. And so those are 10 principles that you can find if you uh, follow the link there to this website. I just read five of those 10 principles, which I think are sort of uh, are at the core of what we're trying to do here. So we design to sustain, heal and empower communities, in our case, autistic communities. We center the voices of those who are directly impacted. That means we need to center the non-speaking autistic people in particular when it comes to things like ABA. We believe that everyone is an expert based on their lived experience. So we need to hear from people firsthand. There is no substitute for that uh, firsthand perspective. We work towards sustainable community-led outcomes. Community-led means autistic community-led. We work towards non-exploitative solutions. So neurodiversity light may sound nice, but it's got nothing to do with uh, 
the new diversity movement. It's the opposite, it's pushback. That needs to be understood. Um, so this year, we are planning further <clears throat> coordinated panels and events. Um, we'll host further discussions and coordinate uh, internationally and beyond until the rights of autistic people uh, are adequately supported by appropriate protocols in all countries that have signed the Convention of, of the Rights of uh, Persons with Disabilities. So we must not allow the spread of ABA to continue and must educate healthcare professionals and educators in the new diversity paradigm and the essential role that autistic ways of being uh, play in all societies in terms of progressing towards greater levels of social justice and uh, equality. And as a community, we must co-create ecologies of mutual care and peer support services that are safe for autistic people um, of, of all ages. And um, if, uh, yeah, I'm personally involved in the education in particular of healthcare professionals because uh, I see this as a key element um, as it's typically healthcare professionals that introduce parents to the, or often introduce parents to the idea that, oh, there's something wrong with your child. Your child might be autistic. And um, if that's being done in this pathologizing way without any understanding, yeah, it should be done very differently, right? I mean, people should celebrate that they've got an autistic child that actually may open up a new world for, for these families. Um, so we need a very fundamental cultural change. So uh, now I would like to invite uh, Karen and, and Tanya to contribute, uh, you know, what, what, what do you see as the outlook going forward? Um, just um, ensuring that in my case, I would say they need to respect that communication in, is a human right. This is stipulated under Article 2 of the Convention that we need to understand that uh, communication is a basic human right, especially to non speaking autistic people. Now, how does it apply? How does communication under Article 2 of the Convention? applies to non-speaking people, but I will define what Article 2.1 uh, that talks about communication. Now, communication means all types and formats of communication, including spoken languages, sign language, written text, braille, touch, large print, plain audio, plain language, human reader, accessible information and communication technology and other types of communication. Now for non-speaking children, Communication is a human, uh, they will need access to assistive devices. Communication to me, it's so important, especially to uh, autistic um, ways of being. I believe that if, we, if everyone must adhere to the convention and uh, listen to what we as autistic people have got to say works best for us, <laughs> and that also includes non-speaking people, we will, we will live a very productive life. If only the society really takes its part in listening to what we say is helpful, then the world can be a very uh, better place. And it's not just um, what we're grappling right now. I can say in our case in Kenya, case in point, um, uh, lack of diagnostics uh, services for autistic adults, they don't have that because psychiatrists are made to believe that the only diagnosis you get is when you're a child. They miss that. And such trainings for uh, psychiatrists, especially for undiagnosed autistic adults here in Kenya, they, it must be looked into account. So I think we need to really look beyond just thinking that you will only get a diagnosis as a child. Yet there are so many undiagnosed autistic people in Kenya who don't have that kind of uh, accessibility. So there's need for, awareness creation and understanding that communication is a human right and people really need to listen to what we are saying as autistic people and abide by the CRP. Thank you. Thank you. Tanya. I think Karen has put the emphasis in exactly the right place where it needs to be. Currently discussions about what is best for us, what therapy should we be getting? 
Autistic people are not at the forefront of those discussions. The discussions are being held by others. The principle of nothing about us without us is being thrown to the side. And if you focus on communication, not on, oh, we're going to force you into speech therapy, because by the way, you get a thing like abusive speech therapy as well. Go look on Twitter at some of the people who are AAC users, who are non-speaking, and who talk about how they were abused into speech. And that's not communication. How is it that so many parents are putting their children into ABA to, because it will help them to speak, but you do not care what the people who are autistic who already speak have to say? I don't think that you care about what we have to say. I think speech is just some kind of a thing, as long as I'm trying to force my child to speak, because in, in Africa, particularly, pa parents get asked this question by other parents and by other people in the family, when's he going to speak? So there's pressure for speech, but there's not pressure about what is he saying? What did they say? You went to a meeting where there were actual autistic people, what do they say? They're not interested in that they're interested in the speech. So if we focus on communication, then we're going to get to the nothing about us without us, then things are going to change. If you read some of the message, which my fellow activists are saying in South Africa, Zekwande Matenjwa, for example, he's Zulu, speaks well, using uh, 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 AAC, he speaks probably about three, four languages. I don't know how many they actually are. So he certainly can communicate. He, he left school at the age of 15 where he said, I'm doing well at school, it's fine. I now have access to communication so I can be in school, but I don't wanna be in school. There are millions of non-speaking autistic people in Africa who are not gonna be reached in our lifetime. We're gonna die without ever having their thoughts known if we do not focus on that. We can't focus on what people think their behavior should be like. There's no life if you can't be known for who you are. And if you can't contribute, like people like Damon are contributing in a major way to disability rights beyond the sphere of autism. But if we don't give communication, that con contribution can't even be there. And the right to be able to lead a life outside advocacy, the right just to be able to talk about ordinary things that they might want to be talk about. So yes, I would say that's the message. Focus on communication and ask the people who are communicating what helps them. Nothing about us without us. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so now we can, I think we, we are on time uh, and we have time to go through the Q&A and uh, yeah, we've already got a number of questions. Just like to remind you here, you see the um, links uh, online where you can find us uh, and uh, keep up to date with what's going on in terms of our campaigns to get um, ABA banned. And uh, there's also a link to um, the website of Autistic Strategies, uh, which is, I think, uh, probably the main resource on non-autistic, uh, non-speaking autistic ways of being. Um, and uh, then uh, if you're interested in what's going on in Kenya uh, and uh, in Karen's world, uh, there's a Facebook uh, page with further details. So in terms of the, the Q&A, um, here are some of the questions that uh, came in via your registrations. So uh, I think the first three I've assigned, or I thought Tanya might be the right person to answer them. So Tanya, do, do you want to give it a go? Okay, right. So that's what's up on the screen. Let me just move it. How do we run a parallel campaign to get people to voluntarily stop ABA before the ban actually happens? Right, I want to talk about what's happening in South Africa in this regard, because it is quite encouraging from within formal bodies. Uh, speech and language therapists generally are pretty anti-ABA and they are just looking for autistic people to lead that and they will support. They're not going to lead it because it's not their disability, but they are ready to support. If we move forward, for example, I'm going to be contacting um, a disabled politician whose party was involved with pushing for the ban on communication, uh, sorry, on, on conversion therapy for gay people um, and linking up with that because he has a disability and he's part of the same disability, cross disability network that I'm in as well. So we believe that we can through, there is support from among the therapy communities in my country, certainly. They are credible professionals 
uh, who publish internationally as well, which means that on international bodies for their various professions, they start to get respect. We're actually working with uh, an anti-colonialist or decolonizing kind of approach in speech and language therapy. I've attended some of the sessions which are absolutely fantastic. So it's very intersectional. So that's the one part. The other part is with parents. We have um, good support, and this is internationally actually, um, from a variety of parents who are actually quite strongly against what they were originally involved in themselves, and some of them just never got into it, um, who are ready to support our campaigns and to, to reach out to other parents. We have people just informally within the therapist community who have been in ABA themselves and who are part of the, the ban ABA campaign. You just don't see them perhaps so prominently here, but they are in groups. They are trying to pull other people out of it. So we should be doing that so that if we don't eventually get to a ban where it's banned just on the books, um, you know, and the laws is against it, but people turn it underground. We know that things like conversion therapy for religious reasons could easily go underground to where it's, they're trying to not, you know, get themselves monitored. We don't want that to happen. We want to change the mood. We want to change the paradigm so that people are not inclined to doing this in the first place. Okay, I'll try to keep my other answers short. As you know, I can be for that. For the most, how do we engage respectfully with survivors to not re-traumatize re them? And this is a question for the survivors themselves. So I am lurking in, and with permission, in a number of survivor support groups for ABA survivors. I do chat to um, non-speaking survivors of ABA as well. Some of them can be very scathing. The one who's, who said that his parents abused him, but they knew of no better. He's actually very good in terms of his gentleness on how, how to do this type of thing. And we should be getting that from the survivors themselves. How do you do this? How do you bring somebody, like you put them up on, on the screen over here and you pull them out in front of the crowd, or do you allow them to contribute the, their messages separately? And then we take that through to the various bodies that could make a difference in support. Then a question regarding the neurological consequences of repetitive ABA strategies, which don't consider a child's mental state. Let me just see. Example, my son uh, reports shame and anxiety from being unable to say no. His opinion was never considered um, and his every move was corrected to the point where he has difficulty in trusting his own instincts. Okay, there is a combination of we're talking now really about the rehabilitation of people who have been there. And there are some people who are quite good at this. And I'm talking, some of them are non-speakers themselves. Some of them are ABA survivors who will help and support other ABA survivors. Um, Noah Sabak, I just think of in general, not necessarily on ABA. He is a non-speaking autistic who has his own consultancy to do peer support for things like anxiety, because he gets the way that non-speakers experience which would be different because you've had different kinds of trauma. That's the one part. Another um, person would be a good psychologist whose words, I really suggest reading her blog. Her name is Dr. Henny Kupferstein, and it's, I think it's hennyk.com, that's the, uh, her blog. She is, uh, she has done some research in ABA as well, research on trauma caused by ABA. And she is a piano teacher. She's pretty disabled herself has balance syndrome and a number of other things and she's autistic but she has worked a lot with ABA survivors in music now she's not a music therapist she's a music teacher but she has found through that process of rebuilding I'll give a brief example and then I'll close it here uh, she had a non-speaker who came sorry she had an ABA survivor who came to her and who was asking her did I do it right? Am I okay? You know, needed this constant reassurance. And she said, you don't need my approval all the time. And she said, and this, this child said, but then how will I know if I'm good enough? And she saw that the child is completely unaccustomed to validating herself. And she was able to help the child to turn it around. You do not always have to look for the approval of other people. I know that that's what you've been trained into. You can't know yourself unless you've got the reassurance from your ABA handler. <laughs> but um, so there are people like Dr. Kupfschustein, there are people like um, Noah Sebek, the people from within the community of survivors. I could even point to uh, uh, Cassian, she has a new surname now, uh, but fun, uh, foundations, for 
Divergent Minds is the name of the organization where Cassie is, um, and Oswin Latimer is there as well. They focus on this. They focus also on engaging with people who are in ABA to, to help them. And, and they, they focus on people who feel that ABA can be reformed. They will go into those groups. Ultimately, what has happened with all the people that they've engaged with who felt that ABA could be reformed is they end up leaving ABA because they realize that you can't, actually, you can't inform something, you can't reform something that's built on a bad foundation. You, 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 you'll have to knock down the whole, the whole building. But yeah, briefly, these things can be done. The, the, the neurological consequences have actually also been studied of the, this type of thing, New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, Dr. Um, Torres, Dr. Elizabeth Torres has a good webinar recently done with Alfie Cohn, the educational expert of uh, several decades, where she describes what happens when you ignore a child, what happens when you ignore a typically developing child who is crying and you say, no, let them cry it out, let them cry it out. There's measurable damage to their brain at an early age. There's patterns that get formed that get you don't quite change it. You only cope with them lately. So do not ignore your child. Do not submit your child to planned ignoring. Children are vulnerable. They need support. You're not building resilience and independence at such an early, early age. And thank you very much. Uh, Alex has provided a link that you can see on surname and also how to pronounce it. So, okay. Over to you again. Yeah, that was brilliant. Um, another uh, question here is, when funding is controlled by government and um, government-based funding or uh, basis funding on legislation, what can we do as educators who work for a governmental institution, i.e. schools, which seem oblivious to the human rights concerns around ABA? Um, yeah, this is tricky, of course, uh, if you're government uh, mandates that you have to do uh, certain things which you know actually involve human rights violations so i would suggest uh, well support our campaigns uh, there will be campaigns in your country um, and if not uh, yeah, please get in touch with the autistic collaboration trust we are trying to coordinate all these campaigns um, uh, internationally uh, there's also i think um, a um, you know, organization in, in, in Europe, uh, UCAP, uh, which is like a consortium of autistic organizations in various countries in Europe. And um, recently we've done a very nice collaboration um, with them and a whole raft of, I think, well, nearly 30 autistic organizations across the world um, where we uh, pushed back against uh, the, yeah, the dehumanization of autistic people and behaviorism. So reach out to the autistic communities in your geography and uh, collaborate with the activists. And uh, that's, I think, the way to go. It's uh, via this channel as well that um, neurodivergent and autistic educators, and we have uh, plenty of autistic teachers, um, most of them are just undercover, right? It would be endangering their careers in this um, uh, climate where there's the, the stigma is quite high. Uh, but uh, it's, it's via organizations like ours where we can anonymize reports and uh, feed them to those people uh, in governments who need to hear what's actually going on on the ground. And so uh, what we're also doing is um, uh, we've got uh, things coming up like Neurodiversity Celebration Week, which runs in, in, in schools. Well, we are focusing this not only on the autistic children, but also on the uh, autistic teachers to make everyone aware that this applies to everyone. It's not only children and it's not about making children less autistic. It's about actually creating a culture where being autistic is not something that you need to uh, be ashamed of. Um, next question. Um, what can we do to educate parents, pa caregivers for whom who may think ABA is helping their child? Um, especially some people claim ABA stops self-harm behaviors regardless um, of the harm being caused by ABA. Um, yeah, again, I would say go to the websites uh, and the organizations of autistic people. Um, on our website, on the Autistic Collaboration Trust, you'll find an index of such organizations uh, organized by geographies. So, um, 
there you'll find resources and people who are very happy to educate uh, parents and, and caregivers. And so, for example, here in Aotearoa, we set up, set up a dedicated website for education of parents and, and caregivers because we know that they are being um, bombarded with, well, advertising from the ABA industry. And um, we want to provide an alternative. So we, we have volunteers that um, are happy yeah, they, parents can reach out to them and ask for assistance and uh, we are uh, advising them uh, in, in the best possible way. We meet with them, we uh, meet their children and uh, we encourage them to think about um, making sure that what they're aiming for is to create uh, children, autistic children that can thrive on autistic terms. So those terms will be different from the terms that the local culture may prescribe. And that's something that, yeah, it's a learning curve for parents, but that's okay. Um, and um, what we have can testimonies of harm by ABA be used in courts of law worldwide? I don't know. Um, Karen, do you want to comment on that perhaps? Uh, just repeat our question again, please. Can um, testimonies of harm by ABAs be used in courts of law worldwide? So this is from a legislative perspective, you know. Um, so we've got mm. these testimonies of harm. Um, where are we at with the, the, the courts? Um, do you, are you aware of any um, lawsuits? In Kenya, I don't think the, uh, we are aware of what's happening with uh, but what I can say uh, in reg, I would say somebody was restrained, but not to an extent. Uh, th there was a school that uh, th that has been reported. Uh, there was a there was a I cannot say the person's name. Uh, there was a case that had happened where a child was <laughs> restrained. So. Um, like he was tied up and had injuries. So, but <laughs> I wish I would go further, but uh, but I don't know whether there are any lawsuits in regards to uh, yeah. abuses, but we'll have to find out, yeah. Yeah, well, I can... I mean, what, what I was gonna say here is this relates <laughs> to, right, the, the human rights and all those countries that ah, have okay. rat ratified mm -hmm. the human rights legislation. I mean, that's the uh -huh. angle that can certainly be, be used. And, and often you then discover that, yes, uh, countries have mm -hmm. ratified uh, the, the treaties, uh, but uh, they're yeah. actually not adequate protocols in place. So it's, it's uh, yeah. And that then comes back to this education and, and campaigning to actually get the legislation in place so that there is a, a local legal mandate that can actually enforce. We do. So we do have a dis, we do have a disability uh, law in place right now in Kenya, uh, but the problem that we're facing right now it's implementation. Mm -hmm. And uh, That's it. yeah, the problem that we're facing now is just the implementation uh, part because you see, when we try and engage with uh, leaders in government, when it matters to do with disabilities, especially those with psychosocial and intellectual disability, mm -hmm. they have this kind of, uh, you know, this preconceived uh, narrative that if you have a disability, it has to be seen, it has to be physical. So they leave out those with um, those when you're divergent and even those who are autistic. Yeah. We do have a law. Uh, we do have a disability law in, in place <laughs> at the moment, but it has not mm -hmm. yet been implemented. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm conscious we are, I think, just slightly over time. So I think we should start to wrap up. Um, and I think uh, the next question there, what is the self-advocacy scene like on the continent of Africa? I think, uh, Karen, do you want to wrap this up in, in one or two sentences? Um, it's still, it's still uh, in its, let's say in its infancy because we started an initiative to um, uh, educate uh, a lot of people in, uh, we started a session on the CRPD, uh, that is autism in Africa. 
where we train guys on the CRPD from scratch, that just the basics about the CRPD and how they can utilize it uh, to help autistic people uh, across the continent uh, in, in fighting for their human rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we, we, we better, we better uh, wrap up here um, yeah. because uh, we were over five minutes late now. Mm -hmm. So there are more questions that we didn't get to answer and I'm sure the, uh, we'll make sure that we um, uh, also look for questions in the chats and I'm sure we'll cover them in, in articles and in further panels that we'll coordinate. So. Uh, Thanks everyone uh, for attending this session. It's been great to have uh, so many people here and um, we'll uh, post uh, the slides online. So you'll have all that information um, plus uh, the recording um, and we'll produce a transcript that might take a little while to clean that up, but um, we'll make all this available. And then please do get in touch if you want to take things further. And for example, uh, start a campaign towards banning ABA if you are located in a country where there is no such campaign yet, because there are many resources that um, we've collectively um, in the autistic communities have developed um, that can be used to, to that effect. Um, any closing words from you, Tanya and Karen? Um, I think that, oh, let me just see whether this is on. Have I enabled my, yes, I have <laughs> enabled my mic. Um, encouraging is that people are moving towards next stages now. I have nominated a non-speaking autistic person to our independent monitoring mechanism of the CRPD in South Africa. I'm still waiting to hear the outcome of whether he has been accepted. We have within the Autistic Strategies Network, um, an autistic attorney who is going to get training on human rights to be able to drive this further. So um, the, the questions which we were unable to answer, like can you currently you know, raise the, the, the objections to ABA in a court of law? Yes, to some extent you actually can. Um, if there were abuses which are already covered by laws in South Africa, that has happened with AAC before. And, they, and there are quite a few people who are very favorably disposed towards AAC users. And when I say AAC, for those who are joining later, I'm talking about methods of communication where somebody else might usually use speech, but it's not speech. It could be a device, it could be pointing to something, and so on. Um, and, and we're working towards, and we do have some opponents there who might say, that person over there isn't doing it for themselves. You've set them up to this. But we, uh, in general, we have a strong support from people in those allied professions, and they are keen to learn more, except for in the collaborative relationships with ABA people, or people who are offering a mixed bag in, in some special needs schools, which tend to be private schools. So it's important for us to get a message out there to the public um, uh, school system and also to the public, as you said, focusing on health, because those are the people who are the gatekeepers to all of this. And we are working on that. I'm on a cross disability network board within my province. I'm not on uh, any other autistic whatever thing, because cross disability support is important. People will dis support you if they are deaf, if you've supported them because they were deaf, you know, they'll support you that you were autistic because we support all each other. We all care about the CRPD ultimately, and that's as as Karen said. We, you know, in Africa, I'm also part of that that group, um, Autism in Africa, which is a group that has been convened to teach Africans uh, in, in the autism sphere whether they are autistic, whether they are parents. We've got a rural parent from a small village in Malawi, Malawi for example, in our group. We've got people from Somalia, all working towards the same thing and who are going to be learning about the CRPD and what it means practically in a situation. Even if there isn't a law yet, you can put your foot down and say, I have a right here. But if you don't know about your rights, if you're not aware of them, you think you have to take all the nonsense that comes with that. So that's why we think training in the CRPD in practical ways in Africa is really important for everybody, regardless of literacy, regardless of their communication capability, regardless of where they live. As long as we can connect to them, they need to know about their rights and how to support the rights of others. Thank you. So I think um, we should uh, yeah. conclude. So thanks everyone. And um, I hope we'll all uh, connect online and uh, 
make significant progress over the course of this year. And uh, maybe we'll do another one of these sessions next year to report where we're at. Hopefully with mm -hmm. some positive news. Take care. See you.